Phil, I think we're all familiar with the Big Bang Theory, but I wonder if I could ask you, what was the spark that created Bath Arts Workshop? I think it was my friend Abel Lawrence, um, who I lived with in London in a small flat in um, sometimes called West Hampstead, otherwise known as East Kilburn. And we, I think it was him telling me to get off my backside and do something and stop complaining because I'd been, we'd been living in this flat and I was working on a building site and I was very unhappy with my lot in life. And Abe said, what do you really want to do? And I said, I want to go and set up another arts lab because I'd been working at the Drury Lane Arts Lab in London hitherto and that had closed and I was now on a building site. I was unhappy. Abel was getting very fed up with me and he said, just do it. And I wrote to three or four uh, local councils, um, one of which was Bath. And I said, I've got this idea. Would you like an arts lab in your town? To my astonishment, I got a letter back from Bath, the only letter I did get back from anywhere, saying, oh, yes, we're thinking of um, opening a, an art centre in the Grove Street in the old prison. Um, we, should, we, should, we should have a conversation. So my friend Ross and I needed no further encouragement, and we hitched off down to Bath that weekend with £40, I remember, between us. And uh, that was the beginning, really. We printed a leaflet and we put it out and we held a meeting in a very bizarre coffee bar at the bottom of Lansdowne Hill called The Crypt, where the tables were like coffins. So we all sat around in this ghoulish environment and had a conversation about art and culture and freedom and ideas and collective practice and all kinds of stuff. And that was the start. Well, it, it didn't work out the way the council intended it to. You, did, you didn't open an art centre in the old prison. What exactly was the arts workshop? We, we hear a lot about counterculture. Can yeah. you explain? What the counterculture was? Yeah, well, I think the counterculture was a kind of reaction to... I would go as far as to say it was young people, predominantly saying the kind of world that's being built in the shadow of the world wars, which was very, very prominent in those days, as you may remember, was not the kind of world they wanted, we wanted. We didn't kind of particularly see this kind of drive for materialism and prosperity and a kind of competitive environment as one that promised very much for us, I sense. So we were looking for alternatives. So to me, the counterculture came from a kind of deep, unconscious yearning for something different. And it manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, at its heart, I think it was about compassion and kindness and collectivism and people working together. A, sent, a thing about freedom that wasn't about just about this notion of individual freedom, I'm all right, Jack, but actually freedom being a collective thing, but connectedness, I suppose, being connected to other people and connected to nature. How did you manifest yourselves? So what did the public see of you? And hmm. how did the public see you? Well, <laughs> what they saw of us was, at, at the first, was a, an event, a series of events in the Victoria Park, uh, where we where we would be on a Saturday afternoon. We would put up inflatables for kids to play on. I remember Paul Cresswell doing a one-man play at the first event. Poets like Brian Grist and Tony Lopez reading poetry, Johnny Hodges playing his guitar, kind of happenings, really, from the 60s, which, in a way, these days, is you might almost think, a bit old hats, just sounds like a kid's play scheme or something. But those kind of things didn't really happen in that world at that time. And so it had made quite a stir. In terms of how it was received, I think the Bath City Council, who incidentally I don't think I ever did have a meeting with about the Grove Street Prison, um, were, uh, were mixed, I would say. One was quoted as saying, we don't want the John Lennon art here in Bath. And another was quoted, this was in the Chronicle, and another one said... Um, oh, they're doing it in Hyde Park, and apparently it's quite the thing. 
So there was quite a mixed reaction. The Guardian uh, quoted you as being uh, the most famous and success, uh, successful alternative arts group in Europe. That's quite an accolade from it, a national it was. newspaper. It, it was, yeah, that was John Hoyland, wasn't it, bless him, who's no longer with us, but he wrote that article, and I remember thinking at the time, is that really true? I mean, we certainly made waves here. I mean, the, he wrote that some years later. I think that was 1974. So I'm talking initially with those events of 1970, but it really took off. It took off big time over a period of two or three years. And I would ascribe that trajectory as being partly luck in that we, I think the timing was right. And also a lot of very talented people came out of the woodwork. Some were already here in Bath and some chose to come here. And there was something about Bath, in, in, in a way it was a fortuitous choice of location. In there's something about the kind of crucible of the, the, the hills. It's almost like a theatre in itself. And of course, as you may remember, and some people certainly will remember, what it was like back then, it was kind of black. The buildings hadn't been cleaned. You still saw people around in bath chairs now and again. I can remember staying in several flats where there were three taps, hot, cold and bath spa. I don't remember the bath spa tap working very well, but, you know, it, it was a very different place. And for us as young people, and predominantly it was young people that drove it, although as it grew, it was all ages, and I should stress also all classes. I think sometimes people think, oh, it was that middle class thing. It wasn't actually. Most of the key people involved in, uh, in the arts workshop came from uh, working class backgrounds. My, my own background's mixed, really, in terms of class background. And so it wasn't all about that. And one of the things that in the new book, which I should be plugging, um, Bath Arts Workshop Counterculture in the 1970s, one of the writers, of, in one of the contributors to that book, talks about how what the arts workshop did back then was begin to, was one of the first things really, certainly culturally, that attempted to bridge the two, um, the, two, the two sides to Bath, the working class side to Bath, which has always been there, you know, terrific place where things were made and constructed and people worked hard at manual skills to, to build stuff like cranes you'll see on docks still all over the world, that kind of thing went on here. And then there was the other side, there is the other side, the Georgian, the wonderful Georgian architecture and the whole history and cultural history of Bath in that sense. And those two things have sort of tended to be very much a divide. And certainly culturally back then, the Bath Festival w was very much on the, on the cultural Jane Austen end of things. And one of the things we wanted to do was kind of create something that, would, that had a wider reach. So with our festivals in 73 and 74, we went out and built geodesic domes out in Whiteway and up in Odd... Well, we didn't build a dome in Odd Down, but we ran a lot of events in Odd Down out on Kensington Meadows to try and bring the city together in that way. And at that, by then, we had a big following of people getting involved and it, it was always a very participatory thing. Um, and I guess we were seen then uh, as what well, we were seen later anyway as one of the kind of pioneering organizations around the development of this notion of community arts that was not a term we ever used actually because I think we didn't see us doing good work for the community we just thought we were the community and we were getting involved with anyone that wanted to get involved and that that was pensioners and it was kids and and it wasn't just theatre, and it wasn't just art, and it wasn't just music, but it was also an adventure playground. We didn't have any money, so we started selling second-hand clothes, and we ended up running two shops, and then we didn't have any way of transporting things, so we ended up running a transport service, which actually provided a really good, cheap way of people moving stuff around at a time when people there weren't as many people with cars, and people didn't have vans and stuff. So we ran King Kong Transport, which moved a lot of people, moved a lot, I can remember a movie, <laughs> being stuck on a lot of Georgian staircases with sofas and beds and having a lot of fun in the process. But that brought money in, because in those days the Arts Council didn't want to know us actually, um, or rather South West Arts Association as it was known then. We later discovered actually that 
there was a reason they didn't want to know us. When we uh, were able to interrogate the um, Victorian Albert Museum archive and find the Arts Council records and go through the correspondence from that period, where it was, where it was very clear that the officer in charge in Exeter, Southwest Arts guy, didn't didn't approve of us. He said he'd come up to Bath, he'd had tea in Auntie Margaret's tea shop on the Paragon, and he said, I think his concluding line was, but where is the art? Question mark. So he didn't really get what we were doing. But meanwhile, in London and elsewhere, there were more, perhaps I would like to say, more progressive spirits getting involved in the Arts Council. And in the end, we vice-chaired, one of our number, Nigel Leach, vice-chaired the brand new Community Arts National Panel that then began to support this kind of work. So when John Hoyland, bringing it back to him, wrote that article, he was kind of acknowledging that we had played a crucial part. But to call us the biggest in Europe, I think that was a bit good old John, but I, I'm not sure quite <laughs> you, where he, how he measured that. You <laughs> caught him on a good day. Yeah. It, it wasn't just all entertainment either, was it? You were campaigners too. I, I read that you were, you were aware of climate change years before anybody else was talking about it. Yes, I, <clears throat> I think I'll, I'll use the royal we. I'm not sure how aware I was, in all honesty, but certainly some of our number were very much so. And and I learned from them. But because we were a mixed crew, and quite early on, some of our number, Glyn Davis, Thornton Kay, principally Rick Knapp, who went on to set up Walcott Reclamation, all clever people, creative people, and had a, had a, a vision at that time um, of concern, really, I suppose, driven by a concern about what was happening to Bath. Bath was being pulled down, the sack of Bath. You know, Walcott Street had been pulled down, Southgate had been pulled down, and they were on their way to pull a lot more places down. The council hadn't got it at all. They didn't understand at the time that the city actually was not just about the Royal Crescent and a few grand streets, but it was about the whole infrastructure of the city, that Georgian city. And there was huge concern, and of course it was only when it got in the New York Times in the editorial column that the penny finally dropped here at the Burgers of Bath realised that actually they were about to bite off the hand that was feeding them in terms of American tourism if they did much more destruction. That was what really stopped it. But meanwhile, people like us, or Glyn and Thornton and others, were looking at buildings like the one we're sitting in, like the Museum of Bath at Work as it now is, it was back then a derelict Georgian tennis court and it was about to get pulled down. So they said, no, it shouldn't be, and they did plans for it, which actually were among the factors that stopped, because one, Glynn's an architect, it was among, that That was one of the factors that stopped it being pulled down. Um, we also did plans for Green Park Station. We did plans for Walcott Village Hall, neither of which were ultimately pulled down. Um, I'm not claiming we were the only people campaigning, but we were part of that. We also needed to build stages. I mentioned the geodesic domes we put up. We needed people, you know, that, that, that came through the same process. The engineers and the architects got together and said, actually, we could build stuff in this way and that way. And they were also looking at how we get power to those sites. So it was like, well, maybe we can use solar, maybe we can use wind. So it came out of a practical need but those individuals have gone on to do amazing stuff since in all sorts of fields, in those kinds of fields, in academia. Thornton runs this international um, salvo organisation that's the uh, kind of global architectural um, salvage system whereby if you've got something you need to sell or you need to buy, you go onto that website and, and it connects you to a, a global network of people that are in the same. So, rambling a bit here, but I hope you. Yeah, I hope I'm. No, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. There are lasting legacies, aren't there, of uh, those 50 years? We've still got Bath Natural Theatre Company. Indeed, we have. Yes, Bath, uh, the Natural Theatre Company was. One of, the, one of the things I talked about when we set up the arts workshop and I wrote to Bath about was two things. One was kind of an arts workshop where people could come together and practice art and people could get involved. But it was also about setting up a theatre company. So it was always a priority 
And very early on, we were able to establish the Natural Theatre Company with people like Ralph Oswick getting involved right from the word go. So when I talk about that talent that came in, obviously, notably, Ralph would be one of those names, but there were many others, Brian Pope, Jackie Pope, um, Dave Herschel, uh, Mick Martin, a uh, whole Corinne de Cruz, loads of people, Jenny Smith, Penny Dale, Penny Stace as she was then, a lot of those names now involved with writing the book that we've just brought out. Well plugged. <laughs> um, the whole experience described as a moment of freedom, is, is that a, a way you would look back upon it? And the other thing I've got to ask, we all get older, so maybe there is a natural end to things, but it's, it's not there anymore. Why? Well, I'll answer it in two parts, if I may. The freedom bit, I think I mentioned earlier, I think a moment of freedom, <clears throat> a moment of collective freedom. I think it's really important, that thing around, <clears throat> this was a collective effort and experience that we shared. And I think that the kind of ethos of that, that, that around compassion, around respect, and, you know, more at a harder edge, I guess, around things like anti-racist, um, promoting equality, those kind of things that have sadly become very controversial in, in this rather more divided age. We were very much advocating those things and as you said earlier, we campaigned around those things and supported campaigns around those things. None of that's gone away, arguably. It's all, my goodness, we need compassion right now. I think there's a deep yearning for that deep yearning to see more kindness in our social and political landscape at the moment. And so I don't think it's that any of that's gone away. Um, the organisation itself, Bath Arts Workshop, still exists as a charity, sitting behind the Natural Theatre Company um, and providing them with a means of raising money from time to time to do community-based projects where they would need to go to a charitable trust, for example, to support that work. So actually it still exists, but it, in, a, in a very different way. And obviously the natural theatre has gone on to great heights, performing in 80 countries plus around the world with an international reputation. So that, that kind of really took off big time, um, as did other things like, for example, bicycles back on the green theme with John's bikes down on the London Road. John Potter was got involved very early on and was one of our gang and he went on and did fantastic things with bicycles in the 1980s and setting up the London to Brighton bike ride and many other things that have raised millions and millions for charity ever since. So <clears throat> it was an extraordinary coming together of a lot of people but it wasn't, I guess the message that we try and talk about in the book is that this is, we're not saying, look, we were great, we did all this stuff. Actually, we're saying, we were great some of the time. Yes, we had talent. We made a lot of mistakes. But actually, you can get together with other people and make things happen. And it's still possible, however difficult it's got. And we acknowledge totally that we had, some ways it was easier because we had cheaper rents, because it was possible to draw down national assistance without being made to feel like a criminal for a few months while you sorted yourself out and got moving. You got paid properly when you got a job and you didn't have zero hour contracts and all the kind of things that young people face today. I absolutely feel for them big time. But I still think, and it's not the case that there isn't still fantastic art and work going on all over the place in all sorts of ways, but it's much more difficult to make an impact now because there is such a plethora such a blizzard of information coming at us all the time on so many platforms. You know, Ken Loach made, who of course lives in Bath, made Kathy Come Home in the 60s, and half the nation saw that film on television, or saw that play on television, which went on to, you know, establish Shelter as an organisation. There's the bell, probably telling us we're, we're beyond time. <laughs> last orders. I think we're on last orders. I've got one final question to yeah. put to you. In your opinion, has Bath lost its edge? I mean, you guys and gals came along and gave art an edge. There's plenty of culture here, but is it as edgy? 
Well, I'm not in a really strong position to know because I don't live in Bath anymore, but my sense is that there's been, nationally, internationally, there's been a homogenising of culture, which is a sad thing because I think it's, the edge has been taken off an awful lot of what's going on. But I would say that below the radar, there's still amazing stuff being done and I'm quite sure it's going on in Bath. I know for a fact through things like the Fringe Festival, which continues to this day with great success every year, and things like, I mean, I don't know the names of the organisations here anymore, sadly, but I hear tell, my daughter lives in Bath and she tells me things, and I know other young people in Bath who talk of things that are going on. I gather the Bath Carnival is a pretty good event every year now, or has been pr prior to COVID. Um, so I'm sure stuff is going on and I would be very loath to say it's not happening anymore. I mean, on a national scale, you look at Banksy, <clears throat> you look at what's going on in cinema, you look at some of the amazing television drama that's been done over the last few years, probably arguably stronger than some of the stuff that gets into the cinemas. And you look at uh, the, write, the new writing that's going on and poetry. I mean, creativity is bursting out all over the place, but sadly, it's under-supported and shamefully, this government, I'm sorry I'm going to get political, have downgraded culture in the curriculum, just cut FE, just cut uh, arts and humanities budgets by 50%. Somehow they think that's a good thing. I'm sorry, it's a really bad thing and it's going to really hurt this country. I think we should send Lady Margaret with an umbrella to sort them out. I really think it's a good idea. Let's do it. <laughs> Phil, thank you very much. Wow, you're good.